do. This relaunch of, of Men on Blue. Uh, my name is Ron C. C. W. Chidebe. I'm the executive director of Project Penglu. And um, uh, Project Penglu is a nonprofit. And uh, we are really collaborating with um, our partners to really host this. So I'm really, really delighted to welcome you all. I'll quickly go ahead and give my um, quick opening remark, and then we can just um, go straight to the program as planned for today. Um, so uh, prostate cancer, for instance, now is now a leading cause of death in Nigeria men. In 2018, about 13,000 Nigerian men were diagnosed of prostate cancer. However, just about 5,000 um, people actually died of this disease. Um, in 2020 as well, over 15,000 people were also diagnosed and about 8,000 people died. Clearly, um, we can really see that uh, prostate cancer has become a very crucial uh, public health issue affecting our men um, in Nigeria and black men really, and men all over the world. So this has really become a very serious issue. And then a few years ago, Project Pink Blue started a program known as Men on Blue. And what we did in this program is that um, we actually wanted to really change the way people think about prostate cancer. Because every day, I mean, every month and mostly in October, we see NGOs bringing out different innovation, different activities all over Nigeria, talking about breast cancer, but very few is really known about prostate cancer. We also see a lot of breast cancer survivors, women talking about breast cancer, but very few. We don't have um, a lot of men who are talking about prostate cancer. So in 2017, we started this program known as Men on Blue, and we were actually funded by ACT Foundation to really develop this intervention. We provided screening to 2,000 men um, from over six states across the country. And after providing this screening, we followed them up up to six months and was able to publish the result of this work on Lancet Oncology. Um, so Men on Blue has become a very significant project in Nigeria because we were able to really educate a lot of men, provide free screening for these men, and also provide a support for these men. Uh, many of you are already aware that Lancet Oncology, for instance, is a very high impact journal. Uh, for Lancet Oncology to accept your work, it really means that your work must be very, very renowned. So we are really hoping for the future and we're building upon what we've done with the Men on Blue. We're trying to expand this program in a way that many men across Nigeria can really become advocates for other men. And that's why we are hosting this Men on Blue event as a great opportunity to really advocate for men and then to also appeal that really, that men really have cancer and that men need to be supported. So the goal of this event today is, is in two ways. One is to provide the public awareness where we can educate the general public about this disease. And then secondly, where we can also, you know, inform policy advocates for prostate cancer patients. We have phenomenal speakers today. We have a distinguished professor of political economy, Professor Pato Tommy, uh, who has really, um, you know, we're really delighted that he has joined us today. Um, so thank you very much. I will end my speech here, and then we can show a documentary of Men on Blue, our uh, documentary of Men on Blue, then we can have our special guest speak and then we can move to the next part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ahmed.
Um, Professor Emeritus of the University of Nigeria now. My name is uh, as a Professor Peter Konyekwere Ebibo. I'm a Professor Emeritus of the University of Nigeria now. I'm still a consultant, a clinical psychologist in the University of Nigeria teaching hospital. I studied in the Julius Maximilian University of Würzburg in the Federal Republic of Germany. And uh, I married a German, came back to this country in 1977. And uh, we have been here nonstop together since then. But initially, we were going to Germany once every two years. And after some years, maybe as from about 15, Years now past, we have been going to Germany every year nonstop, except now that we have COVID. Let's see. So each time we went to Germany, we also did medical checkup. In the meantime, our children are, have a doctor, a who is a doctor, uh, among other children, who arranges uh, medical checkup. That's first thing, medical and dental checkup. <laughs> That's the first thing I do before I can now start holidaying uh, with my children and my wife can visit our people and so on. So as from 2014, I think, 2013, I started having uh, checking up my, my PSA and uh, initially it was 4.1. In the next year, I went again, it was 5.1. The year after, it came to six. It now came to 7.1 in 2016. It told me that there was, there was an activity that even, even in the process, uh, PSA, can go up to 10 if the and it's still not be malignant. But in my own, there's an activity rising from four, five, six, that prostate cancer grows very slowly. All the tests come together and they mm -hmm. confirm mm -hmm. that I have prostate cancer. And that I was lucky that it had not left the, the, the prostate itself. I asked her, which one is the best? She said that the best is uh, operation. I said I'll go for the best. My children are not accustomed to me being ill. And uh, they were also frightened. So, and all of them made great sacrifices. Young people who are just starting work made great sacrifices to raise the money. You know? And uh, put themselves and myself had already prepared ourselves for the worst. You know? But all of us were optimistic. But I led the way. I went to home now and collected my wife because I didn't feel that I would do that jump, <laughs> you know, without my wife. And meanwhile, I mean, I've been a Christian, a Catholic, but uh, I was not so prayerful or so, you know, I wasn't a fanatic. But during this period, I, I started uh, practicing my relaxation uh, training because I use relaxation to treat so many people. I'm a clinical psychologist, a psychotherapist, and uh, I've treated you know, a large number of people. 
uh, using among others relaxation training methods. I was booked for pressure. I was given a room. <laughs> it, you know, he needed to be really composed. Because there are some forms. When you come to that world where they keep you, you pass through many processes. You come in first and fill the forms. I believed strongly in myself that I would come out of the operation because I had not yet filled a chunk of why I'm in this earth. The person who was my um, oncologist, a surgeon, was a woman. <laughs> but he, she did such an extraordinarily good job because the operation lasted five hours. They took away all the glands around. They called them the watchmen. And so that if they tested the watchmen, all the glands around the prostate, it would mean that the thing had spread. And we kept our fingers crossed. So the woman came so far so good that they didn't see anything during the operation that should indicate that the cancer had, had left the prostate to touch any other part of the body that the PSA was 0 0.001, which means that they didn't find anything, and they didn't find anything uh, in, the, in those watchmen. I was nothing. So it just means that the process, the cancer was removed neatly out without any other thing. Of course, they had uh, taught me on how to breathe, because I was, I was, uh, they didn't know I was an expert in breathing, but because I was going to use the breathe. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, due to time, we will not be able to show the entire documentary. Uh, we'll be moving to the next part of the meeting. Next mm -hmm. part of the meeting. Uh, um, this documentary will be available on our YouTube. Um, uh, so I'll just pass it over to um, um, Bernard Badamasi to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Pato Tommy. Um, good afternoon from here. I know we're watching for every part of the world. Uh, thank you so, so much for doing this and um, for the first time. I am um, having the opportunity to join men and women of um, goodwill to discuss something concerning man. You know, um, anytime you hear about man before now, you said that man is uh, not at home or man is never there. But thank God, this time around, men are here. So I quickly want to see this opportunity to introduce somebody who represents hope as far as nigeria is concerned somebody who represents the interest of a better nigeria somebody who's done everything possible within his power to make the youth believe that running away from nigeria is not the best option so it is a great honor to have you here and so ladies and gentlemen i present to you professor patutomi professor lagos business school founder center for value in leadership you're most welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a um, pleasure and uh, really a privilege to be able to come on this platform and to um, share some of my thoughts and experience um, regarding the subject. Well, First of all, I have always uh, thought that healthcare was very, very important and that you gauge a society by the attention that it pays to healthcare. Many years ago, I began to proselytize 
the importance of health care uh, through the work of uh, a Princeton economist, um, Angus Deaton, uh, Professor Deaton, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2015, uh, written a book, The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality, and makes the stout point that uh, many societies are not equal because some have invested more in healthcare. Surely, uh, if the persons who have all the talents are about to die of some illness because the healthcare system doesn't work, the competitiveness of that society uh, relative to one in which there are such investments uh, will not be the same. So the importance of healthcare has always been one that I, I played up. However, I didn't quite think of myself as being uh, a direct advocate for some specific uh, healthcare issue uh, because uh, most of my my life I have worked without falling, as they say. I hardly uh, the the joke in 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 um in my office is that I am a a donor to the um. Uh, HMO scheme because I <clears throat> just never went to hospital and I I was um, working all the time and uh, no nothing to show that I, I would have an ailment and then but I was conscious because I I had um, a father who passed very early at age fifty two to cancer. I was sensitive to the cancer factor. And uh, so I um, tried to do my annual checks and particularly to uh, check out the prostate. Um, things seem to be okay most of the time. I will get the usual tests and I'll be told, okay, no problem quite yet. Then, just at the onset of COVID, uh, about 2020, 2021, uh, I had done my annual check uh, here in Lagos um, uh, at the Afri Global uh, Diagnostic Center. And um, there was some elevation of the PSA. Uh, the doctors thought it was still nothing uh, to worry about, but it might be a good idea to touch base with an oncologist. So uh, um, after that check, I determined that I would um, visit with an oncologist. And then I was in the um, United States and uh, a, a, a doctor friend had uh, an onco oncologist uh, as a, I'm sorry, not an oncologist. Um, um, poo -poo -poo, I remember the urologist, sorry, yeah. Had a uro urologist mm -hmm. as um, a, a partner. And so I, visited with the urologist who was Nigerian. And uh, basically he said, yes, PSA was becoming elevated, but it's not a big problem. Uh, just I get on finasteride. So I was uh, uh, put on finasteride and I would swallow those pills every day. But six months later, I check again PSA is still elevated. It's moving from um, about four to six, and then improves, and then goes back. And so I was beginning to pay more attention to it. And then talked to another urologist uh, who then thought 
perhaps it was time for a biopsy. And uh, uh, I was wheeled into theater. And a couple of days later, result comes back. Yes, positive. And um, I was immediately put on a hormone treatment. I um, was back in Nigeria. I contacted a cancer center here in Lagos and uh, began to see uh, doctors there. I was engaged in activity in Nigeria around elections and all of that, but I kept up um, with visiting the doctors. Uh, the first thing that struck me when I visited uh, the cancer center in Ikeja was how much trouble they took to ensure that people did not see me uh, because uh, they thought it was not uh, probably a good thing to be seen, to be a cancer patient. And I, I quite frankly was surprised by that because a disease is a disease. What's the difference between malaria and uh, cancer? But there is a mindset that we need to deal with here. Um, so, Anyhow, um, I immediately the uh, political season came to uh, 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 approach the close around March. Uh, I returned uh, to the United States and uh, had to do a round of visits to several specialists and the options of uh, treatment we have laid before me. There was radiation, there was uh, just the a traditional chemotherapy, there was surgery and all of that. And um, each of the um, specialists sat down and walked me through the consequences of their own approach. Anyway, in the end, I I settled for um, radio, radiation. And I had 45 sessions uh, daily, except uh, weekends, uh, radiation. Um, at the same time, I was also um, going through um, hormone treatment with uh, quarterly injections and daily uh, uh, pills. Um, we have come through that season uh, and seen PSA drop from close to 10 to 0. Um, 0 0.01 or something like that, 0 0.025, then 0 0.01. Uh, so we believe that we have made um, quite a bit of progress. Uh, we, um, although the hormone treatments will go on until sometime the middle of next year, uh, but I was struck by the fact that um, there's a lot of ignorance around um, prostate cancer. And I wondered why enough was, that we're not doing enough to get men aware uh, obviously, women were doing a great deal for breast cancer and all of that. I, even I had been recruited very, very early in the push for awareness to, to be an advocate. Um, the uh, governor of Ondo State, Ruchimia Kerudulu, went to school with me uh, in Ibadan. I think it was a year, my junior, and we were quite good friends and still our friends. Uh, and um, his wife who went to school with me at the University of Nigeria and her uncle was my roommate. So uh, we had a connect there that went back to the early 70s. And so when she encountered breast cancer and started an initiative, uh, she turned to me as a speaker for one of the events to launch her initiative 
was a premier hotel back in the, oh, I guess, 80s or so, or 90s. I don't remember exactly when. But I then spoke up for breast cancer, encouraged um, uh, people uh, in that regard. So I thought if I could work with women to raise awareness, why should I not do the same for an affliction that I had, I was going through? And so I began to write about it. I tweeted about it. Uh, and I was struck by the fact that, first of all, some people thought, no, you shouldn't let people know that you are ill. And I'm wondering, is that an offense to be ill? Oh, no, you know. And I found out, to my chagrin, that there are lots and lots of men. In fact, it turned out that almost every other man that I talked to was having a problem with prostate cancer of my age. Uh, but people were hiding it. And unfortunately, people were dying uh, from hiding it because they didn't learn what they could do differently. In fact, the first cousin of mine who was younger, actually passed only two years ago from this. And and I thought, no, this is not right. We have to change attitudes. We have to try and educate people about the fact that this is just another illness and that the earlier we discover it, the greater the possibilities that we could overcome it. Uh, by the time I finally got uh, to, you know, uh, uh, radiation and all of that of mine, um, it had reached three point uh, 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 and um, if people caught it very early, stage one, stage two, and you know it can be taken very. But but people fear that the word cancer is a death sentence, and so they are uh, 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 awkward about talking about it. And I, I think that we need to change that, you know, um, way of thinking, so that people know that this. It's another ailment that they can treat and that they can get get well. I have anyway, since um, I made myself available to speak up on, on this, and uh, I'm hoping that many more will do so, and that, um, you know, we can save ourselves uh, both the agony of early loss, the impact on our economy, because, I mean, Quite frankly, um, research has shown that uh, uh, talent, you know, reaches its peak. We check those who have won Nobel Prizes. They're usually between their 60s and uh, and early 70s. And, and it seems to be when this disease strikes men the most. And so so I, I think that it is a an obligation of citizenship for us and the duty of policy for those who are responsible for public policy to actually insist that men get tested and that the result of the tests uh, become part of health care uh, uh, policy. We cannot uh, continue uh, to um, pretend that this is one small personal problem that people will deal with. Um, now, the other thing is that there are so many remedies that are being uh, offered to people. Um, I believe that remedies, uh, both from conventional Western medicine and from uh, more uh, herbal traditional approaches may all be good, but it's important that um, uh, people get enough consultation to be sure that they are doing that which is right for themselves as people uh, advertise this path or the other path. Um, I, I found that many, many of my friends, and I didn't know that, had gone to India for um, surgery related to uh, elevated um, prostrates and uh, prostate cancer, um, but there are many who swear by uh, local uh, um, herbs 
um, uh, for me, I uh, do not downgrade any particular path, but think that one requires a lot of wisdom to combine what is available uh, in their own best uh, interest. So that's my journey. And I um, I'm hopeful that I can be part of a, a, a an enlightenment brigade yeah, going forward uh, on this. Um, treatments have improved significantly every day. There's uh, a, a, a new and better way. And I, I think that if we stay in touch with uh, uh, the developments, uh, the chances uh, that many, many more people will survive uh, the the strike of um, of prostate, prostate cancer. So I uh, thank you all, men in blue, and I hope that this goes far and makes a difference. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank you so much for sharing this um, very interesting um, journey. Uh, I I wish a lot of uh, other young men like me uh, were part of this whole um, event so that we understand the journey. Even though in Nigeria today, they say this should start. Mr. Bernard, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. So, um, I I know this um about five years. I knew about this five years ago that uh, from forty you should have yourself checked, you know. And um, for some of us, because of the effect of the economy, we already started checking before forty because I think pressure can make this thing come earlier, you know. So. <laughs> Even before 40, we are trying to see what we can do, you know, and um, by God's grace, we'll see what we can do with our platform because, you know, the man, the man um, figure is not a figure people take seriously, except they want to talk about them in another light, you know. So I just think um, that time will come where we'll understand that for us to be able to take care of our families, we need to first take care of ourselves and be readily available and strong to show that what the family brings. You know, I just pray we get to that stage where we can uh, also prioritize our own uh, health. Thank you so much once again, um, uh, Professor Par excellence, a man who represents uh, what you could call the political conscience of uh, this country. And um, trust me, sir, we are with you in every of this journey. We are with you personally, politically, uh, you're yeah, another statesman now, and uh, we thank you for obliging us. Okay, I think it is now time for us to introduce um, the panelists. Yes, we have a couple of them here, and I would like my co-anchor, yes, my co-anchor, Dr. Choma Mwakama Akano, to please do us the honors of um, introducing the first uh, panelist. And then we'll take turns to introduce them. They have five, five minutes each. Uh, if they can make it shorter, fine, because we took some time before we could all get on this platform to start um, this program. So, um, Dr. Choma, if you're there, please, I will hand the button over to you to introduce the first person. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So, I think uh, Dr. Choma is probably having issue joining, or probably she was on the call before she left, or something. I don't know. So I'll just go ahead and um, you know introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Claire Omashaye. Uh, she's the managing director and CEO of GNCI International. Um, she's also the vice president of African uh, Private Health um, Federation. Uh, professor, uh, Mrs. Claire has been um, a very important investor in Nigeria's <laughs> health care. And she has been someone that has really contributed a lot in Nigeria's health care. So really, really happy to have us around 
the private investment and effort are the gaps. What are the gaps? What are the gaps? Video is not um, on muting, just on YouTube. Hello, Ma. Hello, Ma. So, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Tomi, for that very elucidating um, conversation that you've shared with us. Uh, I totally agree with you that we need men to speak more out of, you know, in terms of what they're going through. Women are a little bit more vocal, but when it comes to issues to do with the man, maybe it's the part of the body that it concerns that people think it's something that shouldn't be talked about. But that is actually one of the issues that we have that faces us in, in prostate cancer. Um, as you know, prostate cancer is the second most diagnosed cancer and the fifth leading cause of death in men worldwide. And when we think about our country, Nigeria, it is one of the most common, it is the most common form of cancer. And there's a lot of deaths, premature deaths that we could, you know, for, get rid of if people would just speak out. So exactly what you've said in terms of the lack of awareness is our, I think is probably the first thing that affects what? all of us. The poor awareness on how in, how you should have your checks. Uh, there should be more campaigns about the importance of prostate cancer, early diagnosis, and it has unfortunately led to late presentation. And by that time, um, the treatment is much harder, much more expensive, and um, you can see the effects. I think also the fact that we have a lot of challenges with screening. There's not a dedicated screening service that's mandatory in our country. And when you think of those that have insurance, some of the insurance does not cover uh, some of the, in, you know, the interventions that are required, be it surgical interventions or the, the medicines or even the screenings in the, in the first place. And that has led to treatment disparities. And so you see uh, an unfortunate number of deaths. Now, I don't like to talk about gloom and doom all the while. All I can say is that I think that there's a role for both the public and the private sector and the civil society. We all have a collective responsibility to raise the awareness on cancers in general, but specifically for men, because men are a little bit more shy and more introverted. It has to have a multifaceted approach, both from the investment perspective and also the awareness perspective. But collaboration, I think, is something that we would really want to push. And I'd like to really commend what uh, Project Pink Do is doing, raising the awareness, getting people to speak out of, out of their comfort zone, getting men to come together to understand that their healthcare is in their own hands and they have a collective responsibility to solve things. So when we talk about the private sector, what are some of the challenges we face uh, and what are we doing? There's a lot of things that have changed in the landscape over the last couple of years. Um, if you think about where we were maybe 10 years ago and where we are today, I can say that a lot has happened in Sub-Saharan Africa and definitely in Nigeria. But some of those challenges that we face that we need to work collaboratively with government is to get access to finance. Treating cancer is not cheap. So we have what we call radiotherapy, which is those big machines that can cost between two and $3 million for one machine. You, you need one or two of those in a, in a cancer center. You also need to have chemotherapy and specialized um, equipment to be able to mix this, the cytotoxic drugs. So I think the first thing for me is access to finance. We need to have dedicated financing, probably interventional funds that are low single interest rates that can help and incentivize healthcare investments. Secondly, we do not have a lot of uh, incentives. We don't have a bouquet of incentives that will help people to invest in the space. For anybody who has tried to build a cancer center, they will tell you that the number of bottlenecks in government are many. For example, we have one called the Nigerian Nuclear Radiation Authority. Um, any cost that is given to a private sector center has to be passed on. The Nigerian Nuclear Radiation Authority needs a license for you to import the equipment, another one to have register your premise, another one to license your equipment, 
to commission your equipment, it totals almost 17 and a half million Naira for you to set up just one machine in a cancer center. In addition, when your machine comes in and you pay two and a half million dollars for that equipment, you also have to pay duties. People can't even afford even you know, the basics. And then on top of that, radiotherapy is almost out of the reach of the common man. So we do need to incentivize and put fit in incentives in place and also look at those regulatory hurdles and get rid of the custom duties on essential equipment and drugs. I don't see why we should be paying any duties on life-saving drugs that are not made in Nigeria that we do not have the facilities to do. And you know, the private sector is working alongside government through the likes of the Healthcare Federation of Nigeria to lobby for in, you know, enabling policies that will be able to uh, unlock the potentials of the private sector and also the public sector. There's a lot more PPPs, public-private uh, uh, partnerships that are coming up. I'm aware that there's one coming up in Enugu where I think NSIA is part partnering with the state government there. There's another coming up in Lagos where they're building a state-of-the-art cancer center. In addition, private sector has now made investments, giant strides in the cancer space. We've had Lakeshore Cancer Center that have started, you know, these treatments in terms of surgical interventions, as well as chemotherapy for, I think, you know, excess of 10 years. Of recent, we've had new centers in Lagos, uh, Maso Ruth, as well as, as well as um, the Asyupo Cancer Center in Calabar, and they have also been able to come into this space. We also have new investments. I know Lakeshore, for example, is also investing in a big space. So lots of new things, but we need to be able to reduce the barriers to entry into this area. Finally, beyond radiotherapy and chemotherapy, surgical intervention is also very important. And we need to have access to new advances. There are laser treatments in Lagos, for example, there's a new hospital, Kilina Hospital, that can do laser treatments. They can also do transurectal re resection of the prostates. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have one center yet that can do robotic surgery. There's a machine called the Da Vinci machine that can be used uh, for doing robotic surgery, which is said to be more accurate, as, you know, sparing the, some of the tissues around the prostate so that we don't have the complications. But this is something that uh, we, I'm sure in the next few years, the private sector or private public partnership will be able to get that in our country. But just to recap, it is very important that men take their own health into their hands, that they do regular checkups, doing their PSA checks, they do their physical examinations as often as possible. You look where you have a family history, and if you have a family history, you go more often. There are professors and doctors on the call, so I'm not going to uh, take the shine out of them, but we do need to have access to newer uh, technologies to be able to bring this. Uh, my company, JNC International, has worked with many of the private institutions to be able to bring access to this care in, in National Hospital in Lagos and around the country. But we cannot stop because the International Atomic Energy Agency has said for every one million Nigerians or any one million people, there must be one radiotherapy uh, equipment. That means for 200 million of us, we need to have 200 machines. At this point in time, we have less than 20 in country and almost probably less than uh, 12 that are fully functional. We have a long way to go to be able to change the narrative for access to quality care for the men in the room, for the men in our country and sub-Saharan Africa. So Ransi, please keep up the great work of what you're doing to raise the awareness on prostate cancer and other cancers and men, please do your regular checkups. And we in the private sector in healthcare will do our part in building the infrastructure, building the skill sets, and working alongside government to advocate for enabling policies that will open up the potentials of the healthcare industry and, of course, the treatment of cancers. Please note the early detection saves lives. It is not a death threat unless you make it one. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so, so much, um, Dr. Claire Omar I know a lot of men who ordinarily want to do something, but women would make them do it with some magic touch and uh, talks. So please, this is one part that you can also help the men. 
Often beg your sisters call their husband go and check. Yes. Um, yes. Also help your tell your sisters. Um, I know you guys can make things happen. If you if a woman follows you to the church and they are donating money, you say you don't want to get up. There's no way your wife can tell you, ah honey, if you don't get up, this is our family, you know. That's how you go and donate against your wish. You know, so you can also do it for us. Speak to us, pet us, and take us. This is the only time you can pet us. You know, that's for where we're growing up, nothing like petting. <laughs> so please, do whatever you can to see how you can help us. You know, another thing is, this speech you just released now, if we have something like this on video, well edited, with um, um, messages on it as you're talking, you're writing, you can have things like this play on the entertainment events. Maybe somebody is doing a comedy show, a music show. Before the main act comes up on the large screen, you just display it there because majority of the people who patronize this kind of event are men. I don't know how many women buy a table to attend a comedy show for two million, three million, or four million. But a group of guys can just put themselves together and say, "Now, ten people at the table, let's pick a table." You know, so if you have about let's say fifty tables, we're talking about hundred. Uh, 500 people. Now, inside those 500 people, I can tell you that 300 will be men, then 200 will be the invited women, either wives, uh, friends, cronies, and all. You know, so I think I have messages like this, uh, properly edited. You're doing a comedy show, somebody comes on board, have a display on the screen. Now, I'm talking from my own field because the comedian. So this is, these are the areas we can play. And I also know that Basket Mouth some years back created a joke concerning cancer, and it was properly delivered, you know, so we'll see how we can create materials around it, so that you don't just tell it like a message, but by the time you put it, you should have put it inside a joke, they will take the joke and take the message at the same time, you know, so we'll see what we can do. Yes, I think it's about us, and uh, we can't neglect your advice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I totally agree with you. It's very important that we prioritize health care. I Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosie, I think she, she. Are we on mute? Rosie, please unmute Dr. please. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, Shoma, is that you? Yes. Yes. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much for holding it down, uh, brother. Thank you so much. It's really been an honor to be on the background and listening in on the conversation. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I I would start by appreciating everyone who has made it to this event. Amen. And once more, happy International Men's Day. I just was on a radio show where men were calling in and most of them were saying nobody told them happy International Men's Day. Did you get that message, Bernard? <laughs> no, it was, that was yesterday. And the, 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 the sad thing is, yesterday is also World Toilet Day. So I don't know if men are shit. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> You know, so, but uh, we we'll forgive whoever <laughs> arranged this anniversary. How can you put men at toilet the same day of all the days in the world? You know, no, so many of definitely, them are not definitely not. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. We really appreciate our men and um, big kudos to Project Thank you for um, organizing it. And I think it's also well. I think it's, um, it coincides well with International Men's Day. And so this is like an outlet or an extension of that event. So we're going to be calling on the next panelist, who is Professor Solomon Rotimi. Prof. Solomon Rotimi is a prof, a prof of biochemistry, Covenant University. He's also the co-principal investigator, inclusive cancer care. Research equity that I care for Black men consortium, and today he's going to be addressing us quickly on the power of data. What are the key and most urgent steps in reducing the burden of prostate cancer in Nigeria? 
Um, could you turn up your mic, please, um, Bernard? I think there is a kind of echo. That is from my. Could you turn off your mic, or so we just check? Okay. And we can we all turn off our mics, so there is no echo. Just trying to check what. Okay. I think it's much better. All right. Um, okay, it's good now. Thank you. I see your feedback. Thank you, Abiola. Yeah, so it's much better now. So good evening once more, everyone. I was just um, introducing Professor Solomon Rotimi, and he's going to be talking to us on the power of data. Okay. What are the key and most urgent steps in reducing the burden of prostate cancer in Nigeria? Prof, if you are there, the floor is yours. Um, we can't wait to hear from your experience and learn from your experience. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chioma. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marosi, Project Big Blue, for inviting me. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Patti Toby. You continue to be a leading and shining light for so many of us in this country. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, thank you so much also, Claire, for you know the pioneering work and little work you're doing in the private space. Uh, I'll just build on what you know has been said. You know, we've heard about screening, but I'll tell you a story of how I got into cancer research. And it was at a seminar um, organized by Professor Falake Dedino, who I believe was also supposed to be here. And I'm happy to just you know give this remark and you know, this you know, to, to, to occupy this space for her as it were, um, who actually is the uh, leading MPI on our consortium. And she gave this talk about prostate cancer. And prior to that, I wasn't doing cancer research. I was doing infectious disease, nutrition, genomics, and genetics, and all of that. And she said, well, the risk, and, and, and that's what you hear about evidence available, the risk factor for prostate cancer. One is that, you must have be a man. So, well, I understand that because you have to be a man to have a prostate in the first place. Number two is age. Whether that makes sense, as we grow old, there are metabolic and biochemical changes that take place that sort of make us to develop, increase our risk of having non-communicable disease. But then the third risk factor is being black. And that didn't make any sense to me. And I challenge her, and she pushed the challenge back to me that you have the skill, come into this space and answer that question for us. And that's what brought me into this space. And so, so far, I can only tell you a few things that we know. Yeah, being black, because genetically, there is something about the genetics within the black population that increases the risk for prostate cancer. But the reason why we don't know so much is that almost close to 100% of research that have been done to provide data about prostate cancer have been done in white population. Yet, black men have almost four times the risk of developing prostate cancer. And even when they are diagnosed and they detect and all of that and they are treated, the treatments still do not work very well for them and they don't derive enough benefit from those treatment as much as the Caucasian. Why? Well, because treatments are developed based on research and trials. Unfortunately, Black people are not often included in these studies. And so the treatments that are available are not perfectly overgeneralizable that Black men could derive benefit from it. Yes, there are what we call, so those factors that I talk about are what we call non-modifiable risk factor. You cannot modify your gender. Even if you do surgery, you're still biologically, genetically, you still carry Y chromosome. You cannot modify your age, no matter what you do. So far, anti-aging work has not really revived, reversed what we call biological clock. So there are different types of aging. There is chronological aging, that is biological aging. 
which is ingrained in our gene. About, there are things that we can modify, lifestyle. Smoking has been shown to be to, to associated with a lot of cancers, including prostate. And so men are, should be dis discouraged, be discouraged from smoking. Sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and all of that, okay, exposure to unnecessary toxicant. And as Ben and you talked about the other, talked about, touched on stress. A lot of evidence from out of Africa has shown that stress is a risk factor. But the question is, we just completed a study and we looked at available measure of stress and we utilize it in the general population in Nigeria. It didn't show any relationship with increased PSA. What people often do is that we have done that study too, where we look at stress factor by the time you compare prostate cancer patients with controls, apparently at age mass control. The stress factors are higher in prostate cancer patients. And the question is, what causes the stress? Is it the cancer that causes the stress or the stress that causes the cancer? And that was what we, that protest is what we tested the general population. And so what is testing us is this. We're very careful in saying this study has been done in the US. This study has been done in, um, in, in Europe. And therefore, it means, hello? We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me, okay. And therefore, it is perfectly generalizable to Nigeria or Africa. So the challenge before us is this. We need to do research within our population and understand indigenous lifestyle, indigenous factors that contribute to increasing risk, for, risk of prostate cancer. But based on available evidence, additional thing that we know increases risk of prostate cancer is having multiple sexual partner. And how does that work? Because when a man has multiple sexual partner, it, 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 the man is at high risk of contracting vulnerable diseases. And vulnerable diseases increase inflammation around the prostate. And that inflammation has been shown enough evidence from our study, we've also seen that increases the risk of prostate cancer. Okay. And so it's because of this lack of evidence that we are doing this research. We've received funding a lot from you know, US government, Department of Defense, particularly because they have a lot of US veteran, vet, veteran you know, army members that they need to take care of. And so the IKEA consortium is funded by the US Department of Defense. And they are the ones providing the funding so far. Additional funding that we have is from NIH, United States Government Department of Defense. But I'm very excited that the federal government has responded to the research gap in cancer space in Nigeria and has set up NICRAD. And I'm happy that the DG of NICRAD is also supposed to be here. I hope he's been able to join. I know he's, been, he's having some difficulty. But those are what we know. And finally, one of the studies that we're doing now is to validate whether consumption of red meat contribute to increase of prostate cancer risk. We know that there's something in red meat that can induce cancer, but we're now studying, does it include, and we hope that within one year or two, we will have the evidence. And as we bring out in some of this, and we will be communicating it, and we're currently working closely with NICRA to disseminate this information and also use you know, indigenous research, evidence from indigenous research to formulate policy that we can use to reduce uh, the risk of this disease, particularly among men. Finally, if you look at all the research that have been done, I agree, more research has been done on breast cancer than on prostate cancer. And it is time for us men to take the bull by the horn. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Prof. Um, that was quite enlightening, uh, concise yet to hit all the points. And I absolutely love um, the fact that we have figures like you, people who have decided to make it their life's work to answer that question. I love the fact, you know, I love the journey, your journey on how you were asking questions and it has led you to this moment. And believe me when I say, I'm sure I echo our thoughts here, that and your life's work in answering that journey is going to influence cancer care, prostate cancer care and prevention in every life. And I really look forward to um, seeing the you know results and um, 
discovery from the research around red meat <laughs> that's going to shatter a lot of people's hearts but you know <laughs> really um yeah you know because we, we we don't joke with meat here in africa so but then i, I and that thing i know about nigerians is that we don't like to die we really love to be alive and so if it it means you know sacrificing just red meat and uh, there are other options sure so thank you so much for sharing with us um and um four times Black men being four times at risk, and yet there is little research on Black people. That's an error, and I'm glad you are correcting it. Thank you so much. Um, um, please, can we just give a round of applause no, for... Um, for no, 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 no. Thank you so much. Let's remember to please mute our mics to ensure that um, this session you know, is seamless. Now we're going to be bringing on board um, the next panelist, Prof. Chomi. I'm really, really intrigued by your name, Prof, because, you know, my nickname is Chummy. My name is Choma, and people call me Chummy. So I really want to know where Chummy is coming from <laughs> so I can be able to blame relationship if needed. <laughs> um, he is the CEO of Lakeshore Cancer Center, Lagos. And today he's going to be talking around the topic medical tourism for prostate cancer treatment. What can we do to drive health system change? The floor is yours, Prof. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yoma. Um, thank you to Ronsi Chidebe and the entire Project Pink Blue uh, group for putting together this uh, webinar. It was very interesting to listen to uh, Professor Pat Utomi and Dr. Cleo Mashaye and uh, Professor Solomon Rotimi. Uh, well done. You know, this is a, a joint effort. Uh, I think I'll share just a few slides to make um, this go better. I know we had a lot of uh, issues with uh, time, but anyway, I'll try to share this quickly. So uh, I was given this topic, uh, an interesting topic. Uh, what, uh, what can we do to drive health system change? And I think some of this has been touched upon uh, by uh, Dr. Marche. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, I'll... Uh, address some of the issues that come to mind. I know the time is very short. So um, there are many components of prostate cancer management. I, I know that uh, this is a general forum. It's not all uh, doctors, but um, uh, some of the important things are awareness building, right? This is a part of what we're doing today. Um, screening, uh, early detection is key um, so that things can be picked up when they are curable. And I think Professor Tomi and uh, the Professor Emeritus on the documentary uh, reflect that. And we have uh, some family members, again, if you pick this thing up early, it can be cured, cured, you know? So um, it is very true that uh, cancer is not a death sentence. Uh, it's important to not succumb to fear and be able to go ahead and get diagnosed and get treated. So uh, accurate uh, diagnosis then leads to effective treatment. And there are multiple uh, aspects of treatment. We're not going to go into a, a medical lecture here, but whether it's a hormonal treatment, chemotherapy, different types of radiotherapy, but even uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Claire Mache mentioned surgery. Um, so the traditional way was open surgery, but in this day and age, minimally invasive surgery is the key to uh, performing these operations with uh, people being able to tolerate them much better. Uh, shorter stay in the hospital, uh, earlier recovery, and resumption of, of, of people's lives. So I think there's one center uh, that is doing laparoscopic uh, uh, prostatectomies now, but uh, in most Western countries, uh, prostatectomies are done by uh, robotic means. Uh, I'm also a robotic surgeon myself uh, for lung cancer and esophageal cancer, and a lot of my colleagues use it for prostate cancer. Uh, but yes, it is true. We don't have a, a hospital yet in Nigeria offering robotic surgery, but hopefully that will change, uh, hopefully by the end of uh, next year. So um, these are some things that you see. But I bring up this list to, to emphasize that collaboration is the key. And I think that has been emphasized. Collaboration is the key. Um, the, one of the, my favorite African proverbs uh, says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So um, really collaboration is the key for us. Um, uh, I, I do talk a lot about collaborative cancer care. Um, because cancer care is increasingly complex. 
Um, it's not just a matter of taking a, a pill. Uh, it's very complex with multiple uh, specialties involved. Uh, so the team-based approach is vital. Uh, we do that routinely in our uh, uh, cancer center. And I work both in the United States and in, uh, in, in Lagos, and the same applies all over the world. But all aspects of cancer care well, that may not be available in one institution, okay? And even in the United States, not every hospital has every type of treatment available. And then sometimes in um, you know low to middle, middle income countries, you have to collaborate across countries, frankly. Um, so uh, that's uh, the reality we face. Uh, I know in Lagos, we do a lot of collaboration between various hospitals to be able to provide good uh, cancer care. So that is very important. And technology facilitates uh, collaboration. Now, tele telemedicine is very popular. Uh, we do consultations uh, for patients uh, all across uh, the country. Uh, we do a virtual tumor board meeting every week that I run uh, at Lakeshore Cancer Center. We have participants uh, from you know various hospitals in Nigeria. We have people joining from the UK, from Canada. A lot of people joining from the US. I usually run it from the US, uh, frankly, but I run it also when I'm in Lagos. Um, and this is this is not um, a rare event. Now there are multiple applications on our smartphones that we can use. Uh, for health purposes. So these are all things that we can ex explore. And everyone benefits from you know, taking advantage of uh, collaboration. Uh, when I come to specific things, uh, I was thinking about a few, a few options. I know my time is very short, but when you talk about uh, healthcare and cancer care, universal healthcare coverage is critical because cancer care is expensive. That's the honest truth. So there, there are some federal programs that haven't really expanded that much. There's some state governments looking to do this. Um, Lagos State, Ogun State, I don't know what other states are really uh, championing that, but that's important. Private healthcare insurance is expanding, uh, both from individuals subscribing or from uh, employers. You know, I know we provide healthcare insurance for our staff, and it happens a lot in the private uh uh, corporations, uh, but there are even community-based health insurance programs. And one of the ones that is very notable uh, in, in, in Accra, Ghana, is a teacher's uh, cancer care program where they subscribe, and if any of them has cancer, they can get treatment at their private uh, cancer center in Accra. So these are some creative things that we need to really explore and push and expand. Um, I think uh, Dr. Mache mentioned uh, collaborations. Uh, Private-public partnerships are very well known. Uh, in my experience, yeah, they can be very effective, but uh, sometimes there's a cultural clash between the private uh, entities and the public uh, uh, facilities. So sometimes you can even have public-public partnerships. When we talk about uh, collaborations like the NSIA Luth, NSIA is a, is a, is a government uh, agency, and they, they, are, they are very effective in helping the public uh, institutions really ramp up uh, their, their, their facilities. So that's great. Private private partnerships, we're trying to push some of these uh, for private entities to collaborate more. Um, it's not, there's plenty of work to be done. There's plenty of opportunity for everybody. Uh, we definitely need to work together and not work in silos. That is very important. Um, as a healthcare entrepreneur, one of the things I've found most challenging is uh, funding. Um, the reason why India became a, such a great healthcare destination is because their government really provided them low interest loans for their doctors all across the world to come back and uh, use their skills in their country. That's what we need in Nigeria. I think uh, the uh, um, intervention fund, the CBN intervention fund, which is currently uh, suspended, I think that made an impact and we need more of things like that. We need intervention funds, we need development banks, the development uh, agencies to really come uh, and get involved. Yeah, some of these uh, agencies officially have programs. The programs are extremely difficult to access and sometimes they're looking to fund big, big programs uh, where you have to bring a lot of uh, equity 
to tap into these things. So, um, you know, I, I don't have enough time to get into a lot of detail about some of these things, but the bottom line is that the wealth and development of any country is highly dependent on its health. And Professor Pat Utomi spoke to this. Um, this is, you cannot really develop any country, any citizenry without making sure that the health is taken care of. And cancer control is, a, a, is therefore a critical element in the ongoing development of Nigeria. So um, in the interest of time, I will stop there. Uh, later on, if there are questions, if there's information you need, I'm just showing my email address and the website. Uh, thank you very much for Choma that was asking. My full name is Chukumere. And um, growing up a little bit in the United States, I guess that's how Chumi came about. But uh, it's uh, Chukumere Wongu. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chumi. Yes, and even, I mean, even though your name is not Chioma, <laughs> I would still I would still claim relationship because my son's name is Chimer. So, you know, you see, uh, there is a, a, a kind of <clears throat> thing there. So thank you so much. Um, I think that was, that. If I, no, I think I know that was really enlightening. Please, can we just give a round of applause for that? Um, I know that you didn't have sufficient time to go into the details um, of cancer care, prostate cancer care, but I loved your emphasis on collaboration. Um, really, it can't be a one-man thing. And thanks for that quote about if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And um, that's something we should incorporate in not just cancer care, but in Nigerian healthcare system. So thank you. Uh, um, at this point, we're going to go into Q&A. I don't know if our final um, panelist is here. Uh, if he's here, Dr. Aliyu Malami. If he is here, then um, we can we can have him. I learned he was having some challenges with his network. So if he's here, I will quickly introduce him. But if he's not here, we'll just move into the Q and A. And since you're you're here, um, Prof. Chemi, if you if we have any questions for you, I'm sure you'll be glad to take it. And to our panelists, please um, stay with us. I'm sure there are people here who might want to um, ask you some questions. So if you have any questions, really, there is no there is no um, template. Any questions around prostate cancer, any aspect of it, whether you want to, if you want to direct to anybody, please go ahead to direct. Uh, if you want to ask generally, uh, we're going to do that for the next few minutes. So you might indicate by ra raise of hand. I see one hand up already. And so you will, I think you can have the opportunity to unmute your mic and ask your question and um, we'll take it from there. So if you have questions, please just, um, you know, raise your hand and we'll get to you. I see one hand up, Bimbola Ashiru. So if you're here, you can unmute and ask your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, um, the organizers of this um, um, event. Um, I think I want to comment, um, um, you know, typically in Nigeria, Nigerians, they don't like to talk about their problems. And that's the reason why we always have problems. They think cancer, when you have cancer, that is the end of story. But um, Professor Solomon, um, Professor Ngogu, um, Dr. Claire Omashai and uh, Professor Patti Tomi, uh, well done for, I mean, bringing this up. But there are a few issues that I want to clarify here. You know, when you do this test, um, your blood test to show, I mean, to show whether your PSA is high or, or low, I think what I found out is that most of the time, they don't tell um, people that um, you need to abstain from physical activities, or probably sexual activities. Sorry, I think I have to bring out so that you can see the face of the person talking. Sexual activities and everything. So when you have the results, it comes out and then some are elevated and you may not know that. Then they do all sorts of checks and say, oh, you don't have it, you are clear. So some of these things they don't tell people, like Professor Rotimi said, that um, for blacks, I, I, I tend to disagree a bit with that because most times, most of the doctors that treat uh, cancer patients and uh, prostate cancer patients abroad, they, are, they don't, I mean, blacks are good there. I know somebody that's close to me, like a father, who have this thing. And um, 
he went to my my Muyo, my Mayo in New York, I mean in America, forgot in the state. And then um, they have actually condemned him. He was 73 years old then. That okay, um, you should go and tidy up. And he said, it's not my portion. And he came back to England. One Indian doctor in England actually saw him and then um, treated him and started injecting hormones into his system. And the part the first third month, the third, third month by six and then um, after the ninth month, it was cleared. Apparently went back to that hospital in New York, in America, Moyo uh, Clinic, what's the name of, I don't know, I can't remember the state where they are. And um, the doctor said, come, are you, what is going on here? The lady, who is an Indian doctor in London, in England, is now one of their consultants. Oh yeah, Mario, in Minneapolis, yeah, man, you are right, thank you very much. So what I'm saying basically is that there, needs, there is need for proper lecturing, proper enlightenment. And I think this group that you've just formed, you need to go out more. And even the clique of the people we have here, about 83 of us, if we start probably leading in this area to let people to let people be educated. And I'm sure some men are scared that, oh, they say they have prostate cancer, they have cancer, they won't be able to have um, probably um, um, do their duty as a man. But the people should forget about that now. If you die, you won't do any duty. <laughs> but I mean, clear this first. It may take you a year or so. I have a friend that did it. And for one year, it, it, it was abstained. So my own point is that there is need to do that for you prof that are into this, that let them know that if you are going to do your blood test, you must not be involved in any activity, probably 48 hours or 78 hours before that. You cannot just have an activity now or probably um, have a sexual intercourse and go and do the blood test. The results will be skyrocketed. It will come up high. So those are the things that people need to let them know and understand. I, I think that's just... My only to comment, my only comment, not question, and how we can probably make this in a big thing to educate many people that look, this thing is, these are the signs of prostate cancer, these are the signs of that. I mean, so that um, people can know that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. No, I wanted to ask, tell you to respond to that. So you're doing, you can go ahead, sir. Well, thank you for, for those comments. Um, um, I think uh, there's a lot of effort going on in terms of trying to raise awareness. Uh, it's an ongoing battle. There are also some things that are going on, radio shows, flyers, programs. You know, there are multiple NGOs, multiple facilities that are working on this. So, But, um, you know, we have a big country, a big population, and uh, uh, the battle continues. Um, there are many things that can uh, give rise to increased PSA including the inflammation, infections. So uh, a single, uh, as uh, um, even shown by the stories we've heard, a single test result is not the end-all, be-all. Sometimes it has to be followed. Sometimes people put, get put on antibiotics. Uh, so, you, But you need to be under the care of somebody who knows what they are doing. Um, you know, as healthcare has become uh, complicated, people specialize. So if somebody is considering the possibility of uh, prostate cancer or any abnormality, involvement will be with a urologist or an oncologist. Those are the two specialties that really uh, can help out. And then, um, you know, at some appropriate time, if it's necessary, a biopsy is done. Um, so uh, those are the comments I wanted to make. And I would say, just so that you don't scare men, it doesn't mean that if you're getting treatment for prostate cancer, that for the entire duration of your treatment, you have to abstain from sexual activity. That is not the case. So don't, <laughs> people, men are already <laughs> reluctant to get uh, a screening. We don't want to make it even more difficult. So, um, but your point is well taken that, yes, sexual activity uh, just prior to a PSA can elevate, the, but the, it's still something that can be appropriately monitored. So I just wanted to clarify that you don't have to abstain from sexual activity for the entire duration of treatment. So uh, uh, we don't have too much time to go into all the details of medical care, but please consult um, uh, somebody who is uh, knowledgeable in this area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just hand over to my co-moderator. Uh, is this here to make any remarks? I think there's somebody else that uh, raised their hand um, that has a question. George or 
Yes. Okay. Did I go okay, ahead? great. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. I see a hand, George. Uh yes, see yeah, you can you can go ahead, please. Okay, my yeah. name is George Saho. My question is very simple. Is BPH a condition precedent for developing prostate cancer? Excellent question. Uh, BPA stands for benign prostatic hypertrophy or hypoplasia. It is a benign, it is a non-cancerous condition that can cause enlargement of the prostate. The reality is that almost every man, as you grow older, the prostate gets bigger. So that is not something that directly leads to cancer, but the symptoms can be very similar. If somebody has prostate cancer and is, is um, impeding urination, uh, a benign and large prostate can do the same also. So um, it is important then for the urologist to distinguish between the two. And that usually comes from doing a biopsy. So uh, that's, that's, that's really important. Um, so BPH usually, um, sometimes medications, but oftentimes the, the prostate, uh, the part that is constricting the flow of urine can be removed. And oftentimes, you know, in, in a minimally invasive fashion, uh, to relieve that problem, but that's an excellent question. I also saw a question in the in the in the chat about watchful waiting. Prostate cancer uh, has various degrees of aggressiveness, so um, you know uh, we we do uh, a score that usually tells us how aggressive the cancer is based on the biopsies. Okay, uh, it's something called a Gleason score, so that tells us. Uh, whether it's uh, less aggressive or more aggressive, other factors come in also, age of the patient, you know, other medical problems to decide what treatment will be best for the patient. So this is usually done in the, the setting of this uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, tumor board conference where you have different doctors, uh, both the surgeons, as the urologists, the chemo doctors, the radiation doctors, the pathologists, radiologists, we all get together and talk about patients and what's the best treatment for a particular patient. So there are some patients that have a less aggressive type of cancer. And if let's say somebody is, you know, 76 years of age, doing surgery at that point might not be the best thing. Um, so these are all factors that will determine whether somebody should just be observed. It might be, again, a very uh, slow-growing, less aggressive type that will not interfere with one's life. And in that case, the PSAs can be followed sequentially. And if they have, it's very slow in rising, um, it, sometimes no treatment is required. But I'm not, I'm not telling people not to get treatment. I'm just saying get expert care and an accurate diagnosis leads to uh, appropriate treatment. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I see a question in the comments. Uh, someone is asking how you can be able to know that one. How do you know someone has prostate cancer? Uh, I think that's how can you detect when one has, okay, when one has prostate but I guess he's trying to say prostate cancer. So um, okay. I don't know if you want to run through the symptoms or uh, if there's any other, any of our panelists who might want to take this question to you are open to, to do that. Um, we just have five more minutes to, you know, for this Q and A and then we call it a day. Um, Oh, yeah, and I see another one I about mean. prevention. <laughs> yeah, um, Prof, you could also talk about yeah, prevention when you're talking about, about prevention when you're talking about this. Yeah, thank you very much. What? Yeah, thank you very much. Just ask question from Bogus. I think there's a feedback from Dana. I think there's a feedback from Dana. Okay. I think we should meet ourselves. I think we should meet ourselves. So we have two. Two devices in the same room. That's why, the same room. That's why we have the echo. That's why we have Is it better now? Okay. Um, yeah, so where prostate diagnosis usually more often than not men are picked up based on IPSA. And uh, just as Professor Wogu said, after that, urologists do what you call digital rectal examination. They sort of feel the texture of the prostate. And if they 
based on their training, they determine a biop for a biopsy. So a biopsy is usually what is done and then goes to pathology. The pathologists then look at the cells under the microscope and they determine whether you know it's normal or it's BPH or it's prostate cancer or it's man meaning that it's manigland. And if it's manigland, they then go ahead and do some sort of scoring and grading, uh, which Prof touched earlier on, particularly uh, the uh the glycine score. And so that's how prostate cancer is diagnosed. Uh yeah. Uh, well, the other one, uh, Dr. Chioma, is on uh, prevention. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said during my talk, uh, there is, again, prevention, uh, as I said, we need to base it on evidence. So what you want to do is you want to maintain a healthy lifestyle, uh, you know, uh, may, do not have multiple sexual partner because that increases the risk of contracting diseases that could increase inflammation around the prostate and microinflammation around the prostatic cells have been shown to trigger uh, prostate um, uh, you know, carcinogenesis. Uh, again, uh, there are a lot of things that are coming up, but we are yet to validate quite a number of them within our population. Thank you, Doc. I, I, I wonder whether you answered the question on the signs of prostate cancer. Uh, my lost a uh, little bit of service at, at one point. Did we answer that question? Oh, no, no, no. Well, I can chime in there. Um, there, there. There are symptoms that can be based on the, the size of the prostate. Can we, can we um, mute? Uh, the echo is quite here. So if it's uh, from just the local obstruction of the urethra, which is the kind of a tube from the bladder uh, through the penis, if there's obstruction of uh, the the urethra by the enlarged prostate, that can cause um, you know inadequate emptying, urgency, having to rush to the bathroom, poor stream, things like that. Again, this is very similar to what happens uh, with BPH, which is a non-cancerous condition. So problems with urination can arise. That's one thing. Now, if the cancer has spread to other sites, let's say to the bone, there can be bone pain. Um, and then depending on how extensive the cancer is, it can also cause you know lo other local symptoms. Um, but um, if somebody's having any difficulty with urination, definitely um, that person has to see a, a urologist to kind of figure out what the cause is. Um, but the goal here, as we've been all, all promoting, is to try and detect this before symptoms arise. That is the time when one has the greatest chance for care. I think that's those are the comments I would make. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question in the, uh, in the comment that I'm seeing. I've regenerated a reasonable large database in Nigeria to carry out multidimensional, uh, multi-level modeling no, that's exactly what I, you know, my, the crux of my presentation that we do not have sufficient data and we need data to train the AI, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, you, you touched on. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for me staying so far and for the questions. I think I I have a question before um, I invite my co-moderator to um, move on to the next, um, I mean, to wrap up and move on to the next part of our agenda. I have a question, and it's for Dr. Claire Omoshei. Um, So you mentioned, ma'am, I don't know if you are still here, but you mentioned, you know, um, rightly so that Ideally, we should have one radiotherapy machine to one million Nigerians. And currently, we have less than 20. And, um, you know, still within that 20, we have less than 12 that are fully functional. So my question is, what really is the problem? Um, I, in fact, the question is for you and for any any of the panelists who can answer. Like, what really is the challenge? Um, do we, what, is it that we don't have engineers for maintenance? Is it funding? 
um, or is it that we are buying or importing um, radiotherapy machines that are kind of below standard? What really is the issue um, with achieving this and the constant news about a breakdown because every time we hear patients that say oh you are referred here oh their radiotherapy machine is no longer good oh their radiotherapy machine just put last night you know and we know that time matters in cancer treatment and therapy so what really is the issue and what how can we solve this what is the solution in your own experience i'm sorry i lost part of your question i heard the first part where you talked about the statistics. Can you repeat the question for me? Uh, I lost service. Okay, so my question was, um, given the statistics you shared earlier, you know, and the fact that we have a grossly deficient number of radiotherapy machines in Nigeria, especially when it comes to maintenance, but because having less than 20 and then less than 12 that are fully functional, what really is the issue, especially with those ones that are not functional? Is it that we don't have enough environment, um, um, yeah, biomedical engineers, we don't have enough, um, we don't have enough technicians, we don't have funding. What really is the issue in your experience? And how can we ensure that while we are looking to get more radiotherapy machines, the ones that we have present are fully functional, you know, and then there is also early um communication with I don't know whether it's with hospitals or with patients, just people so that people know that okay, we have an issue, we're going to resolve it within this time frame. You know, because I've really observed it a lot. And as I mentioned, time is of essence in cancer therapy. So how do we resolve this? What are the issues, especially in the Nigerian sector with radiotherapy machines? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I totally agree with you. That is a concern. So companies like ourselves, we have made a huge investment in training biomedical engineers who are radiotherapy uh, engineers, because it takes about... Uh, a minimum four years to go to level one and another four years to go to a level two. So imagine that uh, you don't you don't have any school that trains biomedical engineers in the country uh, that fully, and then now you're talking about radiotherapy that can take four to eight years. So we don't have enough radiotherapy engineers in the country. Uh, some of us have made that investment and others haven't. Uh, secondly, and I think the biggest one for me is the fact that we do not have a maintenance culture. And therefore, unfortunately, it's also not backed up by finance. So teaching hospitals that own large pieces of equipment, radiotherapy, MRI, CTs, have no line in the budget called maintenance or service level agreement, which means the chief medical directors have to find an ingenious way of putting some of their internally generated money aside to pay for maintenance. Un unfortunately, I don't think it is taken very seriously. And when you hear an equipment has been has broken down, it means it doesn't have a service level agreement. Once you have a service level agreement, it is back to back with the manufacturer. There are two manufacturers, Electa and Varian. And I'm pretty sure that any of those two manufacturers that you deal with, as long as you have that service level agreement, it's back to back. We also use um, AI that connects to the machine. And so before even a part in the machine goes bad, the, the um, an email is sent, we already know, and the parts are shipped. You also need to hold a certain level of parts in country. So we're talking about human resources for healthcare, which starts with biomedical engineers. It goes on to the parts, it goes on to the money to pay for the maintenance. And then I dare say that the biggest challenge of all um, is, is the fact that we need to have a multidisciplinary team. The radiation oncologist is important, but the medical physicist is just as important. And we're not churning out enough dedicated radiotherapy re medical physicists in the country. Some of us are making investments in helping and working alongside the association to be able to increase the skill sets, but we need to be able to have more schools and most importantly, more training in country. And I think that one, we do not have a clinical LINAC in the country that is used for training uh, biomedical engineers and radiation oncologists and medical physicists. Of course, you also need uh, radio, uh, radiation um, radiographers. And they too haven't been trained to work and use linear accelerators. And this also leads to, to challenges. So money is the first issue, buying the machines, maintaining the machines, because when you buy a machine, you buy it for 15 years. And if you maintain the machine, if you look after her and service her as and when due, 
have the parts in country, she can actually last 15 to 18 years. So these are some of the challenges that as government, we probably need to advocate to. One, please ensure that you do not buy a machine without a maintenance contract. You buy five years maintenance contracts in advance and you ensure that it's cash backed. That we we also have you know schools, we encourage, we encourage more schools to do biomedical engineering and super specialty into uh, radiotherapy. And that will be you know some of the issues. And then of course we need to look at the number of people who can do radiation oncology and uh, in the country, medical physicists, radiation oncologists, and uh, the radiographers. So I think those would be some of the things that could make a difference. And I do hope that uh, we can advocate through Project Pink Blue to government to look at uh, that uh, as we go along. Thank you. Chioma, thank you, Claire. If I may make a comment also, I can't be on the forum without commenting on this issue. Thank you, Claire. Claire's answer focused a lot on, on maintenance and uh, uh, service agreements and education, all very important. But Chioma, just so you know, you cannot put a radiotherapy machine in a regular building. It requires a very specialized building. Uh, bunkers are required. It costs over 2 billion naira to build such a bunker, okay? Uh, it's, it's extremely, extremely capital intensive. So the main reason why we don't have enough machines is money, because we, we don't have funding sources for a lot of people who are interested in bringing more machines in. And then the machines themselves cost anywhere from one to 2 billion to 2.5 billion naira. So the machines are very expensive, uh, uh, Dr. Mache already talked about a lot of the problems with importation and duties and stuff like that. But even when you can get funding to buy the machine, funding to build the facilities to house the machine, that is the most difficult issue. Because even the few funding agencies that want to fund machines, nobody wants to fund construction. So anyway, I'm just throwing it out there. Thank you. There were a few questions in the chat. I know we're running out of time, but there were a few good questions. Okay. Um, I mean, um, this this has really been enlightening for myself. I can't even imagine for everyone else who is on this, um, you know, who is at this event. Thank you so much for your great insights, not just addressing the issue, but also um preferring solutions. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Uh Chami. Um, let me look at the questions. There was a question about metastatic breast can um, oh. prostate cancer. Yes, okay. uh, there are lots of treatments that are available, um, all sorts of different things um, that are available that uh, an oncologist can provide. So the fact that somebody has metastatic prostate cancer, the person can get many, many, many years of uh, productive, enjoyable life. So it is not a death sentence. Um, you know, in terms of somebody also mentioned, again, watchful waiting, there's somebody from Utah that has been observed. That is also an option, but it's, it's in certain situations. Yes. Please, please, Dr. Choma, can I ask a question if it's possible? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. My name is Ron C. I just wanted to ask this burning question. I know uh, it's like me moving from my role, but it's really burning to me. So is, is the question about sexuality and prostate cancer. What, what can we do? What is happening in other parts of the world? Because it's a very... The sexual health and and can and prostate cancer is a big issue. I don't know just to hear what you all have to say. Uh, can you can you clarify your question? When you say sexuality and prostate cancer, what what do you mean? Do you mean the effect of treatment on sexuality? Yes. Do yes. You mean, yes. Uh, yes. 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 Well, you know. Um. You know. Of course. Somebody even asked a question about the side effects of different treatments. Uh. It's a very long discussion. So for instance, prostate surgery, there are nerves, both radiation and, and the surgery, there are nerves around the prostate that are involved in, in sexual function that can be adversely affected by treatment. So those are the kinds of things that one would go into details about what type of treatment would try to minimize those complications. So um, one of the advantages of uh, a robotic prostatectomy 
is that it's, it's quite precise. It's more precise than, let's say, the open surgery. So there's a, a higher chance of um, preserving sexual function. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, those complications cannot happen with uh, uh, robotic prostatectomies, but that's part of why um, that surgery is uh, more favored. Um, now, if somebody gets the cancer picked up very early, you can even put in uh, radioactive seeds and require no surgery at all, no external beam radiation. So there, there are a lot of details and nuances when it comes to the actual treatment. I think they're a little bit too advanced for the, the discussion we're having today, but I would say uh, sexuality is a very important discussion which is part of the discussion when somebody has a consultation about prostate cancer. Thank you. But Prof, is this kind of nerve sparing um, treatment available in Nigeria for Nigerian men? Well, I know there's a urologist that comes from the UK that performs laparoscopic uh, uh, prostatectomies in Lagos. Um, uh, robotic prostatectomy is just a little bit, you know, more, but with laparoscopic prostatectomies, I, I think there's a, a great... Uh, ability to preserve nerves. But even with the open surgery, you know, even the people who do open surgery, it has to be somebody who is really skilled in uh, in, in these radical prostatectomies while preserving nerves. So I would say that it requires um, really expert consultation. Some surgery is available in Nigeria, some is not. We're continuing to work on making all surgeries available in Nigeria, but uh, we cannot claim to have that right now. I would just add to that um, there there is there are a few urology centers that offer laser surgery, whereas majority do what they call TURP, transurethral resection of the prostate or TURIS, transurethral resection in saline. Those are a little bit less sensitive. So if one were going to opt for surgery here, uh, laser obviously would be the, the best bet depending on the size of the prostate. So you really need to have a consultation both with the urologist and, if possible, the oncologist uh, at the same time. So, it, as I said, this is a multidisciplinary decision. And as Prof said, usually there's a tumor board. No matter what the you know whatever treatment is being preferred, multiple heads come together and look at the best solution. You know, bearing in mind that you may need to do chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, and and so on and so forth. I dare say that I think that sometime within the year 2024, 2025. We will have robotic surgery in Nigeria, but again, it's not just about having the equipment, it's having the expertise uh, behind the, the equipment and the training program to do skills transfer so that more surgeons, Nigerian surgeons in country can, can do that. I, I think that the Nigerian healthcare land space, space is changing. Uh, there's a lot more new hospitals coming on board in 2024, 2025. And I, I do think that for men, um, there's a lot more hope. But please, as I say before, early detection saves lives. Do your regular checkup. Um, of course, do your PSA. Also, go and do your rectal exam. You see that uh, urination is not going the way it is. They stop and start, or you don't empty your blood. You see blood in your urine. Uh, you have pain in your back. You know, those are signs and symptoms. Never be too afraid to see your doctor. Uh, the earlier you see your doctor, share those symptoms with the uh, with him or her, the better. As women have the gynecologist, men have the urologist by your side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Chef. Thank you for your insights. I just saw someone who said I shouldn't jump over a question. I'm, I'm struggling to find the question. Um, we are at, we, we are out of time, honestly, and I'm sure if we even had the whole day, we still wouldn't exhaust this topic. Uh, but before we continue, and I hand over to okay, someone said, does lack of sex increase the rate of getting prostate cancer? I think that's been answered. Um, I think that's been answered earlier. I think it was Prof Solomon Rotini who um, clarified what you know the the relation between sex and prostate cancer. Um, he said, you are asking lack of sex, if that, I think Prof even mentioned, I think if, I, if I really remember, that, um, yeah. so, Prof, yeah. are you here? 
Yeah, yeah, Prof, please, yeah, take this question. Take this question. I think you touched on it. So you could just you know brush up on it and then we quickly uh, move to the next uh, 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 I was just about to tell you to allow Prof to speak on that because that's yeah, very yeah. Key. Yeah, thank that's you. Important yeah, the yeah, the okay. Are, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. So what is known is that uh, prostate cancer is an hormone-driven uh, cancer, which means it responds very well to prostate to testosterone. And so it's been speculated that uh, increased sexual activity could reduce the risk of prostate cancer. There are a few studies that have shown that that is possible. However, it's not it's not it's not be concluded that increasing uh, post, uh, sexual activity for men will certainly reduce the risk of prostate cancer. If you recall what I said, that sometimes these studies are often not don't really have what we call statistical power that is strong enough to say yes, we can run ahead with it. But what is shown again, we know that it it it, it may okay. But what people should be careful of. Is having multiple sexual partners. And I would say that perhaps this is the third time that having multiple sexual partners for men increases the risk of contracting venerable diseases, which in turn could trigger localized inflammation of the prostate that has been shown to increase, you know, to drive prostate carcinogenesis. And so, as much as, so it's a very delicate thing. Yes, there are anecdotal evidence evidence to show that, yes, it's possible that increased uh, sexual activity, you know, would reduce, may reduce uh, prostate cancer risk. So, here as to Thank you so much for that clarification, Prof. And I hope your question has been well answered. Um, I would want to mention um, that uh, we have the presence of the press here. We have AIT, we have Arise News, we have five newspapers. And so that what, what that does for this particular event is that beyond the conversations that we've had in this closed group, you know, there is room for escalating the conversations, the solutions that we've discussed here. And it's also a means for advocacy. Also, Project Pink Blue will be sending a communi uh, communicate to the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment. So yes, it doesn't just end in having this conversation. That's a great first step. But then the burden of, um, of you know, whatever actions that we want to see really lies in advocacy. It's not just about projects being new. It's about everyone who has made our time to be here today. So you are an advocate. It's your personal responsibility, not just to learn for yourself, but to extend that learning to everyone who is around you, within your friends, your family circle, everyone around you. As we have repeatedly uh, he heard here, uh, prevention, 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 early detection is key. So um, I'll be handing over to Bernard now to um, handle the rest of the agenda and we'll wrap up this wonderful event. Thank you. All right, thank you so, so much, uh, Chioma. Thank you so much. You've done a brilliant job. Uh, why I did it was I wanted me to say something concerning sex and um, prostate. In a country where you have people use over 400 million condoms annually, you must uh, find a way to communicate things like this. Yes, because, um, yes, uh, Professor, uh, the statistics are there. The money we use, to buy condo annually, you can buy some of these machines. We can redirect our funds. Yeah, yeah. So I just needed to talk about you. And I see a couple of other faces here. Uh, Sir Abdullah Yusuf, I recognize you, Daddy. Thank you so much. Frank uh, Akarume, yeah, that name sounds like where I'm from. Thank you so much. I recognize your presence here. Uh, not forgetting uh, Professor Patu Chumi. Yeah, it's always uh, very good to have. Um, uh, men that we want to be like in the future, join us in our present. Thank you so, so much. Uh, but I think I've been part of Project PV for the past five years as an ambassador. And um, I know we have first week of February for our cancer work, which is usually a general work for all forms of cancer. But mainly, we see that it's predominantly the women thing. 
we the men, we come, we come like we are there to support the women. Subconsciously, we say we know the good they are doing. We, we, we also need to be part of that work, you know. So um, just last week, we had this report of 340 men be beaten to stupor in Lagos by their wives. So men know the great complaint. And I'm very sure if you see any of them at all, boy, your wife, they beat you. You go say, no, me, why beat me? Ken? Why are they beat me? Oh. But the reports are there. You know, we grow up believing that when we complain, we are weak. You know, it's a sign of weakness when the man goes out to say, oh, boy, this is the female. You know, so we have to make this very, very intentional. Intentional and consistent. You know, it's not something we just do once and off we go. You know, intentional and consistent. So I'm thinking, I'm recommending that since it's a general knowledge that every 19th of November is International World Men's Day, can we carve out something for that day? Yes, can we carve out something for every November 19th, just like we do for February for the general cancer? Can we carve out something for the men in blue for every November 19th, you know, which can lead to world press release, awareness, concerts, you know, sharing of flyers, you know, putting of roll-ups at different uh, marketplaces where people read and see, you know, go on interviews on TV, radio every November 19th, so that that can be particular about men. That can be particular about so that zeroes down the interest, you know, and people will hear more about it. So I'm just recommending. So I think um, we will introduce somebody from Project P Blue who's been very, very fantastic. Yes, you we'll see. Ronsi is a digital man. He operates from everywhere. But uh, if you're operating in Nigeria, somebody must be on ground. Or they will cheat you. Uh -huh. Somebody must be on ground. So the person I'm about to introduce is um, somebody I'm very proud of, particularly. Her name is Gloria C. Oku, the program coordinator Project Big Blue. She will do the closing remarks, and after which uh, we can take a uh, group photograph and close the session. Gloria, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Bernard. Thank you. And a very big thank you to everyone that has joined us on this program today. Thank you so much to Professor Patu Chomi. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Solomon, uh, Mr. Abdallah Yusuf, Franka Karume. Thank you so much. I see so many names here. And um, thank you for staying with us till the very end. This is a very good number. And it just shows that um, people are beginning to understand why this advocacy on prostate cancer must continue. And we hope, just like Mr. Bernard has said, that everything we learned here today, we are going to step down. I am a breast cancer survivor myself. And um, I always tell fellow advocates that anyone that has survived cancer uh, you have to talk to your family member. It's everybody's job to create awareness because um, uh, uh, the awareness has not gone very far. I think we've not scratched the surface yet, especially with the grassroots. And I always say to people, if you ever have a, a cancer diagnosis or you understand what cancer is, you talk to your family members, talk to your friends, the implications of you having cancer, um, the implications of a member of the family having cancer. Like when we start talking about it, we will see that a lot of awareness will go out and early diagnosis will become uh, very, very common. If I, know, uh, if I knew what I know today, I would have taken action more. Uh, maybe maybe my, my, uh, my case will, will be better than it is. So this awareness is important. If we don't have awareness, we cannot have early diagnosis. And if we keep having people present at very late stage, we are still going to have very high mortality rates. So uh, it's everybody's business to, um, to create awareness, it's everybody's business to do advocacy. It's everybody's business to, to talk to the government to do what is right. I know these machines are expensive, but I, I believe we have the money in Nigeria. If we only channel the funds we have to what we should use them for. So a very big thank you to everybody. Um, thank you so much to my, to my uh, ED, Mr. Ron C. C. W. C. W. For putting this together, he did a lot of work in making sure that this comes through. And thank you to members of the team, Uzo, Ifoma Abe. Thank you to everyone. And on this note, um, I want to say we are ending the program now. And of course, it doesn't end here. We are issuing a communique. We are putting out a press uh, statement. 
so that we keep advocating. And like Mr. Bernard has said, we're we really going to look at a date where um, all our efforts, all our attention will be on prostate cancer, just like we do for breast cancer. Uh, it's not going to be a one-off thing. We are going to see how we will keep this men on blue project running until um, we're able to recruit many people and create this health consciousness in men. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And God bless all of you for coming. And so at this uh, juncture, we are going to take a group photograph. So please, um, Ahmed, are you ready? Um, please, I'll ask everyone to turn on their camera. Let's see your faces. And, um, and also, I think, also Choma, I think Dr. Choma wanted to say something before we can... Oh, move. please. Okay. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, I think part of what I wanted to say, um, um, Bernard has touched upon it, and you have also, Gloria, about the continuity of conversations like this. Yes, and, you yes. know, Bernard mentioned something about the um, February World Cancer Day. And I, 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 we, we want to appeal to our speakers, you know, thank you so much for being here. I, um, if it's not so much of, of a bother, honestly, of which I am sure it's not, I'm just trying to be very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, um, I, we really would want to have you again um, for, for this kind of conversation to mark the World Cancer Day on, uh, um, in February next year, God willing, 2024. Um, we're looking to have that in Abuja, so, but as time unfolds or as the project unfolds, you will be intimated on everything that is required. But this is like an appeal to please keep your doors open to us so that whenever we call on you next, you know, you can please be part of this advocacy, this education, this sensitization. And thank you to everyone who has made our time to be here. Really, I'm super, super, I'm so inspired to see um, over 80 men in yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> having yes. conversation on health really? at yeah. that point i felt like i should have added my dad to this because yes. he does not hear what you know he does i don't know but this, because normally i was just thinking maybe it's a main thing men are not conscious but no this has actually shown me that maybe it's just my dad issue so i need to go and keep sensitizing thank you so much for for yeah. inspiring me and really changing thank that mentality you. that i had <laughs> And uh, yeah. I really wish you a very beautiful day. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to also specially thank Mrs. Claire Omashe. Um, this event, she really, really led the entire process, spoke with Professor Tommy. You know, she worked so, so hard. Sometimes um, we actually have meeting at midnight, you know, to ensure that this really happened. Um, so, you know, my, I really, really want to thank you so much for for all your support to cancer control, not just in Nigeria, but globally. And I really, really want to thank you. And I hope as Dr. Choma said, we can host this again at Transcorp Hilton in February, really make it more bigger in person. And thanks for your passion. Please keep up the great work. You have, you've done an amazing job and will continue to do more. The battle is not over. We have a long journey ahead of us. So together we can move mountains. Thank you for inviting us on behalf of all the speakers. I also see Dr. Taufik Ige. Oh, that's yes. Amazing. Yes, even Professor Koye. I'm um, Professor Koye, Pinky Prof, wow. Hey, Pinky <laughs> Prof, yes. Attracted <laughs> all, all the gurus in the uh, cancer space, uh, Ramsey. <laughs> we all align with you. Thank you for everything you're doing and keep up the great work. Yeah. So, so, Dr. Much. Chama, you want to coordinate the group photo or Ahmed? I think Ahmed can handle that. I think we should just yeah. put on our cameras and you know oh, take a good pose and keep our smiles. If you, up have, there. if you have any blue something, just wear it because we're supporting yeah. our men, men on blue. Yeah, so men, the men blue. Um, I think I have blue on my shirt somewhere here, so that works. So please find something blue. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> so, Dr. Choma, you have you have, you have red. Though. I didn't see any blue here. Um. Okay. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> There's so blue on my shirt. That should work. Okay. Dr. Iggy, I can see uh, Is that like an x-ray? Or... Really? Do you have anything to do? Yeah. Okay, Doc, oh Doc my... let us know when to... Doc, let us know when to take the picture. 
Okay. Um, I think I think we're good to go. Oh wow! I see that I'm really the one without anything blue, but yeah. you know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh my god, Mrs. Um, Mrs. I, is showing an agreement. Whoever photograph should splash blue on this white. Dark <laughs> splash <laughs> <some> blue <laughs> with Photoshop on no, the ma, white. No, ma, look what. Trauma, look up to the sky. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, you, right, need to count. This. you need to count so we can. Okay. Count so us? on the count of three, and uh, then we take the picture. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ahmed, have you taken the picture? Ah, better have taken it. <laughs> yes. yes. Who took, took the picture, the just slide. to make sure? We <laughs> took the first slide. We're taking the second one. We're taking the third oh. one. We got everything. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So are we just let us know when we are good to go. We we've done. We've taken the picture. Everything is fine now. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, and wishing you a very wonderful evening. And thank best you. of luck. And please uh, keep it up. Um, bye. Thank you, everyone. Is that Charlie my birthday? Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, your birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> oh, happy birthday. Thank you. I don't, I don't want anything from you. If bye. You know bye, everyone. Help me beg the politician that Nigerians... Bye. 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 Bye.